There you go. And then I'll admit all. Uh, Okay. The screen's locked. Oh. Hang on. When you went on to record, it's locked my screen and I can't. Oh, you need to find somewhere that's about to says you're Hang agreeing. On. You're agreeing. No, I'm okay now. Okay now. Good, good. I'm great to hear that. I think. <laughs> I'm, just admit, I'm just going to admit a few more people because uh, it's only just four o'clock. I don't mind you, mate. It's on Saturday night. Okay. All right, we've got lots of people joining us. That's fantastic. Let's try again. Okay, welcome everybody um, to the Center of Educational Neuroscience Seminars. I'm Jo van Herwig and I'll be hosting this session and it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Derek Bell and uh, Dr. Helen Darlington uh, from Learn Us um, who are with us today to give a talk around educational neuroscience what does it mean in the classroom? And Helen has kindly agreed to introduce herself whilst I admit other people. So thank you very much. As otherwise, um, other sessions, to feel free to put um, questions and comments in the chat box or ask questions at the end. Thank you, Helen, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Derek and I were approached to write this chapter for the book. I'll just give you a little bit of my background and why I was involved in it. Um, I was really fortunate and I've always wanted to be a teacher. So I went and did a degree in genetics and psychology um, to become a biology teacher. At the time, that was quite an unusual combination. I think for at least two out of the three years, I was the only person in the university doing that combination of subjects. Um, but for me, it gave me a really good grounding in terms of the biology from the genetic side for my teaching and the psychology which I've always had a really strong interest in. So I am now in my 18th year of teaching in secondary schools in the northwest and teaching biology and psychology up to 18 in those schools. I have always had an interest in sort of the interdisciplinary side of learning, the neuroscience side and so embarked on a PhD and I completed that in 2017 from UCL IOE. Um, I was incredibly fortunate and had a very supportive school that allowed me to do my research in the school I was working in and looked at the understanding and development of interest, students' interest in science, um, particularly looking at age 14 to 16 year old students. Um, from that, about two and a half years ago, I became faculty leader for science at South Wirral High School. Um, and I'm currently running a project there, a whole school project about bringing in a way of implementing the curriculum and teaching the curriculum that's grounded in educational neuroscience and sort of leading the CPD within the school on that. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'll hand over to Derek and he can introduce himself and start us off. Brilliant, thank you very much, Helen. I'm Derek, as Helen says, I've been teaching a few more years than Helen, like I've been in education for over 45 years. I um, started off teaching in schools, um, primary, secondary, teacher education, worked in universities and doing research. Then I ended up at the Association for Science Education, which I ran for seven and a half years. And finally, before I nominally retired, um, was at the head of education at the Wellcome Trust. Um, currently, I do various bits of work, um, one of which is working with learners to try and improve the links and the connections between researchers and practitioners, particularly to do with education. 
and it was through them that I got linked with the Centre for Educational Neuroscience and I've been part of the Unlock project for the last four and a half years which has been great fun and introduced me to a lot of ideas that i would never heard of which is good. So as Helen said we were asked to do this chapter um, and so when Michael Thomas asked us to do it he said all you've got to do is to read these pieces from other people and then give us a perspective on it from that of an educationist or, to, or a teacher. So that means we've actually read the book. All we're waiting for now is the film and the t-shirt. Um, but one of the challenges when you're presented with that is where do you start from and how do you frame the response that you're going to make? So basically, one of the things that we have done, hang on, my screen's stopped. I'm sorry, this, my screen's just locked up. Let me just go out of stop. Let me stop sharing and start again. There we go. Sorry about that. And it always happens when you don't want it to. So basically, we started off by thinking, well, one of the things we need to do is to set out where we are first. Um, otherwise, people will say, oh, they're own, they've never looked at it from another angle. But basically, we started off by just re-emphasizing one or two points. First one, learning doesn't just take place in the classroom. So although the title of this and the title of the chapter is about the classroom, we do acknowledge, and in fact, very importantly, that learning takes place pretty well everywhere. And it's the combination of things that we end up with the results. We're very much committed to the idea that education and neuroscience has something to offer. But alongside that, we know there is no silver bullet. It's not as straightforward as that. So the other thing is that we just keep saying, what is it going to do in the classroom? What is it going to do to help me as a teacher? In, in doing my job. And one of the things we're not going to do and we didn't do in the chapter is to simply present a list of tips. Tips for teachers are useful, but we feel that unless there's a context in which you're using those tips, it's like having a box of tools and not knowing what tool to use for what job. So that was basically where we started from. And we developed that into picking up a number of questions. We got the four questions which we put into the abstract for the talk, but in developing the talk, we've actually added a fifth. So starting off with why should we as teachers understand learning and teaching? How might that better inform our, pro our practice? And what does it mean in the classroom? Then the one we've just added, how might this actually apply to teacher development and not just the learning of our pupils and students? And finally, what are we missing? What are the things that lie ahead and what have we got to do? And, and when we get to those at the end, you'll find out those changed a little bit as well. But basically, we'll probably put most of the time into the third and fourth questions that you see on the screen at the moment. So answering question one or trying to start answering question one, why should we as teachers try to understand teaching and learning? Well, the simple answer is, it's our job. We're professionals, or we should be. And understanding learning and its implications for teaching and the students that we have, that is the basis of our practice. And therefore, we need to make sure that we do that as best we can. And we break that down really a bit like a three-legged stool. I'm sure you've seen this analogy used in different places. But basically, we're working on the knowledge and skills that we've gained, both as teachers, both in our prior training and also the second thing, the experiences that we've had, whether they're within teaching, whether they're within our families, whether they're within our other jobs that we've done before, etc. And one of the areas that often is missed is reliable research. We pick up things a bit anecdotal and very often the research, whether it's educational research, neuroscience research or whatever, we don't actually always bring that in. So getting those three legs together is important because that gives the stool stability. 
But more importantly for us as teachers, what it does, it informs our professional judgment. And as teachers, as you know, if you've been in a classroom, you're having to make judgments almost every second of the day because your children are reacting to something you've said, something you've done, or something that's been done to them by another pupil. And you have to bring together all of your knowledge, your experience, and any understanding of research in order to make a decision. We get it right sometimes, sometimes we don't get it wrong. But what we can do when we look at the research is to start to step back a little bit and see how that can inform and improve our practice. The other thing that we started to look at and we considered with this question is how much of neuroscience is actually directly um, impacting on what we do in the classroom. And this diagram that we got from Dromit and, and Co that was in the Impact Journal a couple of years ago indicates that it isn't all of neuroscience that has a direct effect. All of it might contribute, but there are different levels that neuroscience takes place at, which may or may not have an effect on what we do in the classroom. Almost clearly, the behavioral stuff is important because that's the thing that we've probably most familiar with and is also helping us. The genes and the molecules, how they operate is probably something you don't necessarily need to know, but it's a question of understanding and basically recognizing that everything in neuroscience isn't going to have a direct benefit, but it could well inform and influence how we interpret other things, not necessarily us as individuals, but certainly as a community. And in the end, we, we came down to probably about three things that this understanding of teaching and learning really should come home to us. The first is we too easily forget the student's perspective. We'll say we don't, but we do, because in the moment we're pressured to get through the syllabus to do this or do that. The student's perspective is important because sometimes they're having a bad day, just like you are. So what are you going to do that's different to make them engage with their learning again? So you need to think, bear that in mind. The second thing is just sheer complexity of learning. It isn't a simple direct process. It's not linear. It happens in all sorts of ways and very subtly sometimes. So we need to bear that in mind just because we do it this way once and it works. It's not necessarily going to do it the next time. We have to bear that in mind. And the third one was that an infant's brain or a young person's brain is not the same as that of an adult. It's not just a miniature version because it's going through a process of growth and development, whether it's physical, cognitively, emotionally or mentally. Those are the things that are happening all the time in that young person's head. And we have to make some allowances for that and try and understand what it is that is causing them to behave the way they do and respond to the learning. The second question of how might we understand learning better to inform our practice? I take it that there are two sides of the same coin, learning on one side, teaching on the other. If I understand learning better, that should improve my teaching. If I can improve my teaching, that's going to improve pupils' learning. It'll also improve my learning, I hope, which in turn informs the teaching. So we're getting into some sort of cycle which should be developing and making things move quickly. Three areas that we just touch on, which I think are worth mentioning, the environment. Within the book, um, as, as, as Michael mentioned last week, there's a chapter on nature, nurture and the role of genetics. Yes, there's a debate to be had, but essentially, if the genetics is there, the nurture is an important part of it. In theory, I guess, if the genetics was just left to itself, there would be some sort of trajectory. But it doesn't. It goes through an environment. That environment imposes limiting factors, which range from a whole host of areas. The physical environment, and that could be as simple as the lighting in a room, can affect the way some children respond and learn. The socioeconomic status, we've had plenty of material about that, trying to track down 
whether it is children from particular backgrounds do poorly just because of the background. We know there is some links and we need to work on that. And the other one is the timing of learning. We all as teachers tend to have to work to curricula that are set out, whether they're national, school or whatever. The point is, and the question in our mind is, to what extent is that sequence of learning most appropriate for the children I've got in, in front of me? So the timing needs to be thought about. And it's all, obviously we understand, it's different for each individual child. So it's all very well planning a curriculum for a whole cohort, but individual children will need to work through that in different ways, different pace, and we need to bear that. The important thing to remember out of this is that actually understanding what these factors are will help us control and develop the children that we're working with. The process of learning itself, we could, you know, as neuroscientists, etc., a lot more about this than I do, probably. But the different bits of understanding that and the detail is going to vary. Thinking in terms of how the brain works, one of the biggest messages from my point of view, certainly, and I think Helen agrees, is the networking process of the brain. The brain doesn't work in straight lines. It works by multiple routes. And that informs the way we learn. So actually, when we recall something, we're very often putting things back together again, rather than just remembering a picture that we had that taken last week or whenever. So the, the, those aspects of learning, but what are the messages that keep coming out? One of the things that comes out strongly for me is the whole issue about transfer of knowledge and skills. And we understand that there's relatively little natural transfer. So for me as a teacher, that says, I need to make that explicit. If children are using something in one part of the, their lesson or one subject, we need to make it explicit that it's almost the same thing in another. And that helps them make those links and connections. Language, similar sort of issues about making sure that it's clear we use a word with a meaning in science. When we use it in everyday life, it has a slightly different meaning. And we need to help children understand that. It seems simple to say, but too often we don't make those adjustments. We also need to go think about making things so much more explicit. Don't assume that children know this and, and recognize it unless we've checked. And then the final thing is, it leaves a lot more work, but there's a really nice chapter by Andy Tolmy and co in the book about science and the way they suggest trying to match the content of science, the underpinning principles of science in terms of um, principles rather than content, how that links to what we do in the classroom. How often do we help children explore causal relationships in, in, and manipulate them in different ways? That's an important um, dimension to it. So those are some of the things that we, th we need to be paying attention to based on the, the neuroscience knowledge. The final bit is the emotional welfare. And again, Helen knows a heck of a lot more about this than I do. But the chapter by Mordo and Gottlieb there, you know, the way students feel affects how they learn. How often do we ignore that? We need to be very sensitive to it. And similarly, as teachers, our own beliefs play an important role in the type of practice we adopt. Now, that doesn't mean to say we just have to change our beliefs, but we have to be sensitive that if we have a different way of working, it may the children will respond differently to another teacher, and we need to bear that in mind. But that leads us to issues around the whole emotional welfare, mental health. When we wrote the chapter, people were talking about them and it was developing. Since COVID, of course, it's really, really top and priority that we've got to bear in mind. All of these issues we need to take on board. So what does it mean in the classroom? We adopted and looked at something that Howard, Paul Howard Jones did in his chapter, and he'd reviewed the, the um, knowledge that was out there, 
looking at it from a point of view of teacher training and education and came up with three processes, the engagement, knowledge building and consolidation. He said that those were three factors that were part of the process. We looked at that and actually were cheeky enough to add a fourth. We actually added application and translation. Now, to be fair to Paul, they included that in consolidation. We think it deserves its own um, section. In addition, we felt it needed a time dimension. So what we came, did, we came up with a, a, a model, which I'll show you in a minute. But out of this, we have addressed one in the book, which was what might this mean in terms of teachers' classroom practice? And the one that we developed as we put this program together was how might this apply to teacher development? And Helen's going to explain all of that to you when I finish talking. So basically, we took the four steps, if you like, engagement, knowledge building, consolidation, and the application and transfer. And we put them and said, well, actually, if we had a learning episode, which might be anything from five minutes to years, and we looked at what might be going on in the early phase, the middle phase, and the late phase. And if you take the engagement, probably you've got something where early on, the top priority is getting pupils, learners engaged in what's going on. That process has to stick throughout the whole learning episode, but it reduces in terms of priority. We then move in and think of the knowledge building. We can't start off with vast amounts of knowledge because children don't have it, the learners don't have it. But what we need to do is to identify some of the core concepts, the core ideas, and we start to build that up. So as the pupils get engaged, the knowledge builds up. And then again, that starts to be reduced because we then go into consolidation. We learn something. We don't always retrieve it easily. We need therefore to consolidate it. And that starts to move through. And finally, early on, there is a little bit of application and translation, but that develops because as the knowledge increases, the confidence increases, the engagement increases, the actual application and the basis for making that application and translation is that much firmer. So we've now got a process which we can apply to a number of situations. It isn't fixed, it's variable, but proportionally, those are the elements we need to think about how we fit those around the way we approach our teaching in order to support our pupils' learning. And I'll pass over to Helen we will give you some more detail of some of the thinking about what that means in the classroom. Over to you, Helen. Thank you very much. Um, so, although we said we're not going to give you sort of a tick list of things that you can do in the classroom from this, um, I kind of feel as speaking from a teacher's point of view, we'd be remiss if we didn't include some of the ideas that can be used in the classroom um, that have come out of these chapters. So. If the first stage is engagement, that's about, for me, building students' situational interest. You want them to actually engage with the work, even if they don't have a particularly strong interest in that. And there are a whole load of strategies that teachers have been using for a really long time. So encourage students to ask their own questions, use social rewards such as praise, and we know how powerful praise is for students, or tangible rewards. Um, I teach in a secondary school and will always say the most important thing I have in my classroom is stickers, because that tangible reward that a student can say, this is really good, I know I've done well, is very powerful. Um, and be able to relate the ideas and the new knowledge you're trying to bring in to students' experiences and what you know their pre-existing interests are. Now, the power of educational neuroscience to me is that as a teacher, when I did my teacher training 19 years ago, 18 years ago, these were strategies that I was being told to use. Now, we're starting to get an understanding of why they are so powerful which parts of the brain are being engaged, why students respond to certain strategies more so than other strategies. 
So once you've got your students engaged, you can move on to that knowledge building and starting to link the ideas and get the new content um, presented to them in a way that they can understand. So drawing on students pre-existing ideas and making connections with their prior knowledge is incredibly important. Um, also trying to draw out what misconceptions they may have. So there are a lot of ideas that we grow up with. They can come from um, suggestions that we've made when we are when they're children. So for example, my son quite regularly tells me that his tea place is full, but his pudding place has still got space in it and he can have pudding, it's okay, but can't possibly eat any more of his dinner. And students carry those ideas with them. Now it's a nice idea, but we need to make sure, we need to get it out there that that's not actually how the stomach works. Um, using models and analogies is really important in this stage. And also allowing students to start to have a sense of control over their learning. And that moves into them starting to develop their individual interest in a subject. So once we have got some basic knowledge and the students are starting to to understand the ideas we need to rehearse that and models of memory have been around for a really long time but interestingly they haven't been used as part of teacher training for a long time so I remember when I did my training memory structure wasn't really discussed and I was fortunate enough that I was teaching psychology A level. So actually knew the models of memory and understood how these things link together. But teachers in other fields, it's relatively recently that they've come across them. And once you have the understanding of why modeling works, why rehearsal works, why space learning works, it's, quite, it's a very powerful thing for teachers. Um, so there's a lot of strategies being used in classrooms now in terms of retrieval, the interleaving, the space learning to help that consolidation. So as has already been discussed and there's a lot of research out there, students, adults struggle to transfer and make connections between different fields every science teacher I've ever known laments the fact that students can draw graphs in maths lessons but they can't draw graphs in science lessons and neuroscience research is starting to tell us why that is and it's the issue of transfer between fields transfer between domains where students almost see it as a completely different skill so making those links explicit working across subjects within schools so instructions are the same, really helps. Um, in terms of application and applying ideas to new contexts, students are gonna really struggle with that. So it's about making sure they understand the big ideas and giving them a huge range of examples and contexts to try and then explain once you have helped them understand what the big idea is that's relevant to that context. This is one of the big challenges from my point of view of the new GCSEs, where a substantial proportion of the marks are based on students' ability to apply knowledge when we know that that's something that students really struggle with. Okay. So this is where we started to divert a little from the original abstract. During the talk last week, someone asked a question through the chat, which got me thinking. And the question was, paraphrasing a little bit now, why is educational neuroscience Twitter full of dual coding, 
retrieval practice and into leaving, but doesn't include the emotional side of things, doesn't include a huge amount of our interest. Um, and this was put, this question was put in as a response that it was nice to see the emotional side being included in the book. And I think it's possibly that the dual coding, the retrieval practice, the interleaving have been picked up because they are seen as quite concrete. They're quantifiable. They're about the cognitive. So it's about the content that students are learning. They are, and I really don't mean any disrespect with this, can be translated as quite simple ideas. That doesn't necessarily mean they are being understood well and they are being translated well but they can be condensed into quite a simple idea um, which you can then pull some clear transfer into a classroom activity so retrieval practice is very easy to translate into a classroom activity um, and you can take a small number of ideas for retrieval practice and apply them in most situations they are not all going to be good examples. They are not all going to be the most effective, um, but it is possible to do that. And therefore they're perceived as quick wins. On the other hand, thank you. Interest, having spent seven years of my life trying to do this and write it up. Interest is hard to measure. Um, one of the conversations I quite regularly ended up having during my PhD with my supervisors is, well, how do you know students are interested in the lessons? How are you, how are you measuring that? Um, and as a teacher, that is, is a very difficult thing, especially when you are in the moment of the classroom there are ideas you can and feelings you can get from students, but it's still tricky. Um, it's the emotional side. I know interest has a cognitive element and has a very strong cognitive element, but I think it's perceived as emotional. Um, it's very complex. It's challenging to then transfer that into the classroom because it's so personal and different people will have different things that trigger their interest, that hold their interest, that will help them develop that into an individual interest. And therefore you need to develop a range of strategies and different ones will work with different students in different contexts. So it takes a lot more time. Um, so, it's very, very important to me as a teacher that I develop interest in my students. But in terms of trying to communicate the research from educational neuroscience into the classroom, it tends not to be an area that's picked up in quite the same way. So this got me thinking about the, or got us thinking about the framework that we applied to student learning and thank you, how that could apply to teacher development. So there's a lot of research to say that teachers' professional development, um, professional development requirements change as they go through their career stages. So someone who is newly qualified will have very different training needs to someone who's very experienced. But obviously this field is moving so quickly that we're trying to introduce it and we are trying to develop teaching in staff who may have been teaching for a very long time. So in terms of engagement, teachers will, some teachers will try strategies because they've seen it on Twitter and gone, this looks brilliant. I really wanna try something new, I'll have a go. Other people may rely on colleagues, being the same, them in the same school or in other, other schools and go, oh, I've seen that work really well. The students really responded to it, so therefore we'll do it. And there are also a lot of teachers who will do it because they're told to. So if it's top-down direction, 
they'll be told this is something that we need to do. Um, hopefully, that will then they will then start to build their knowledge. Derek, can you? Sorry. Thank you. Um, and they'll understand what works for them. That's quite important. Um, everyone has their own teaching style, so you have to find what works for you as well as what works for your students. And we'll start to learn about specific strategies and when they are effective. And this is the point where hopefully they'll start to see the value of engaging with research and bring that research in to then help them develop their understanding of it. Um, so one of the things that we've done as part of our school project and bringing in this new way of teaching or implementing the curriculum is to basically get people to engage with the research in a way that they may not have done so before. So during the summer term, obviously our CPD, our normal inset days didn't happen because we weren't in school in quite the same way. So we developed a bespoke reading pack for every member of staff. And that included Rosenshine's key principles, an article on that. So every member of st staff had that. Faculty leaders then chose an article for their faculty, which was something that they felt their faculty needed to focus on and develop. And we did a quick questionnaire with staff and helped them to identify an area that they personally felt that they needed to develop on. So they had three articles to read um, and were then asked to do some reflection on those articles and engage in the actual research. The work we've been doing since schools reopened then has moved more into the consolidation phase. Um, and that's about in terms of teacher training, teachers growing in confidence, sharing techniques, reflecting on their practice, using coaching when they can, um, knowing when diff to use different strategies with different groups of students, and hopefully underpinning that by engage um, deeper engagement with the research. Now, one thing that we found very recently is actually remote teaching has really helped this phase because now we're generating videos of lessons so we can actually do self-reflection in a way that has never been easy to do it's always been an extra whereas now we're videoing our lessons so we can go back and watch them um, which is a strange strange outcome of the the whole covid situation for us Derek, thank you very much. So once teachers have sort of found this new knowledge, have started to get the ideas, they can then, in the same way we talked about students being aware of the big ideas within a subject area and try and apply those to different situations. If teachers can take some of the big ideas that are in the rest of the book, so the quality of the learning environment that Derek's already talked about, um, the importance of language, so the use of definitions, the use of language in different contexts, the use of metaphor in lessons, um, the influence of pre-existing ideas, the use of multi-sensory approaches, and the need for scaffolding and making things explicit that then gives teachers a framework and a toolkit that they can then go and apply to their lessons and to their teaching. Derek, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. I think one of the things that um, Helen didn't say, and I think she's being modest here, is that having applied some of these ideas in her school, one of the big challenges is working, getting the staff working together. And I think that's shown some massive successes in the work that she's been doing in her school. Um, Thank you. The, 
last I don't often very praise you, do I? Um, last last question, really, just deal with very quickly. You know, there are lots of issues. And when we started the chapter, we had one, well, four questions. One, what are the potential strengths and pitfalls of ICT and even AI developments in, a, in terms of education? And then, of course, COVID came along and we're all into remote teaching. And it's now raised a whole host of other questions all of which need to be there. The, as Helen said, it's not all negative. There are some positives that have come out of it. And it's a question of how are we going to grasp those and take those for, forward, whether they're to do with the neuroscience side or to do with <coughs> general practice itself. The other questions, ethics is an issue. And there's a brilliant chapter in the book about the ethics. Is it really ethical to test things out on students? And in one sense, we're testing them every day for one thing or another. So but it's about how we do it, which is important. The, obviously, we need to think about how we use the research findings. And one of the messages from the Unlock project seems to be that doing just more research in schools in itself doesn't help to inform practice very effectively. It gives you some great results, thank goodness. But we, we need to be thinking about that which leads on to the question that Michael highlighted last week about translating the research in the classroom. It's not a one-way process, it's a two-way process. So one of the things we have to find a way of involving more teachers um, in the development of the research and the translation together with the researchers rather than it coming from just one side or the other. And that was one of the things that Learners was set up to try and at least move towards, if, even if we can't manage it very effectively. Um, so basically, I think we've got one slide which Helen's going to finish on, and then we're over to questions. You're on mute. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> on it. Um, always like to end on some positives. As I said, I have been teaching for a long time, um, 18 years actually makes me an old teacher um, compared to average time in the classroom now. Um, and over that time, I've seen a significant movement of schools to engage with what we can gain from educational neuroscience. Um, and in that I'm including psychology um, and all of the aspects of educational neuroscience. I also am seeing through a lot of work with a lot of the national bodies that teachers and the communities are becoming much more skilled at critically engaging with the research. So I remember various different um, strategies that appeared in school. Um, any other teachers listening possibly remember them as well, where someone comes into school, goes, this is gonna be amazing. We should do this with all our classes um and everyone tries it for a few weeks and goes not quite sure why i'm doing that and then realize that there's not actually a huge amount of research behind it um so i think that's a really really powerful thing that's happening at the moment in schools and because of the internet because of communication networks opening up so much um there is a lot more of effective sharing of information. It's not necessarily being translated in the best ways it can be. And I think we've got a long way to go with that until everyone's using it well, but it is there and it's starting to happen. And teachers want to be better teachers. Ultimately, we do this because we want to be in a classroom. We want to be with students. We want them to learn. We want them to develop as people as well as developing, um, hopefully, a passion for the subject that we're passionate about. Um, we just, in short, want to teach smarter rather than teaching harder. And I think that this is, this is one way we can help with that. So thank you very much for listening to us. And we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Helen and Derek. Yes, I don't know whether um, anyone already has any questions ready or whether I know Helen and Derek, you've also been monitoring the chat 
whether there's anything you wanted to comment on at this stage. Um, I'm happy to pick up one question that I spotted. Um, someone put a question in um, about assessment for learning. And I would completely agree that assessment for learning is really important. I think, unfortunately, um, like a lot of strategies, it's become a little bit muddled. So um, there are a lot of schools who now have a purple pen. And I love my purple pens and we get the students to go through their work and mark their work in purple pens. And that's seen as assessment for learning, but that can be done in very many different ways. So it can be done from the point of view of students literally just check their work against a mark scheme. Now, the learning that they're going to gain from that is possibly going to be very shallow if they are just ticking or crossing. It can also be done in a way that really enhances learning. So to me, I think assessment for learning is incredibly powerful. It's just making sure that the, the learning that occurs is quite deep learning and it's unpicking what that term means. It became a bit of a buzzword for a while of we do it without people possibly doing it effectively. Thank you. Eric, have you got anything to add? So it's just one question, somebody asking about reinventing wheels. I think the problem is that inevitably one does reinvent things. But on the other hand, I think one of the things that educational neuroscience adds from my perspective anyway, is that it actually starts to give you some reasons for why things are happening. And one of the examples I use quite frequently is that of wait time or thinking time or whatever. That was first introduced by Bud Rowe some 50 odd years ago. Um, and, and we've known about it. And yet, how many classrooms do you go into where teachers are trying to push children to respond within a couple of seconds? And yet she said, if you wait for three or four or five seconds, what you get are better answers, wider range of answers, and children are more confident and you get more children answering. Why does that happen? It's actually because of the way the brain works. And if teachers understood that most of us need a little bit of time to think before we respond, and I would also suggest think after we've had a response, you know, that you actually start, to, that's been around. This has added weight to why it's useful, why it works, and therefore in effect, it's saying we should have picked it up years ago, but we didn't because we didn't have a reason to pick it up which is giving us more reason to pick things up and make it work properly. Uh, over to you for anything, anything else you want to pick out. Um, I was just going to pick up on that wait time thing. One of the things that I've really noticed from teaching remotely is I spent quite a few lessons forgetting about wait time because the computer's so instantaneous. You'd ask a question and then you'd be going, why haven't they put anything in the chat? Why haven't they put anything in the chat? Why aren't they responding? And um, so now I'm actually, and I've caught myself doing it today. I will ask a question. I'm asking them all to put their answer in and then I will give them a countdown for them to then send that answer. But I'm also still going thinking time, now typing time, now they can send their answers. And it's, Teaching changes so quickly. I love the uh, comments someone's just put in about teachers and magpies. Um, yes, we are, especially when it comes to stationary, but also with teaching ideas and with changes in, I hate to say it, the way teaching is monitored and the way schools are monitored, there is always a pressure to be doing the next new thing rather than allowing that consolidation phase. Um, which is quite sad, but something that we do need to be very aware of, of helping us embed the ideas. Helen, can I follow up with that question maybe? Is this why you think educational neuroscience can help is to kind of see then rather than picking up the latest new things. And also I think sometimes there's this pressure on doing certain things in education. So for example, at the moment, there's a little bit of talk around catching up programs, but you also touched on around emotional well-being and how important that is for learning. That, you know, is, th is this maybe also how educational neuroscience can help in a way for schools and teachers? 
I think so because I think it can it can start to point us towards some key principles and some big ideas that have got a strong evidence base in terms of the behavioural, in terms of the psychology, in terms of the actual brain changes and understanding that at the developmental stages, which I know there's a lot of individual differences within each developmental stage, but I think that can hopefully mean we come from a much stronger base in terms of that evidence rather than, ooh, this looks good, let's try this today. <laughs> I, I don't know whether there's any other questions. Um, there's a couple of comments. I think there's, there's Richard Baker is trying to ask a question oh, there. I, I keep seeing him stick his hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. I, I, well, I, might have, I might have dropped myself in it by signalling him out, but he has been. <laughs> no, no, I'd quite like to. Um, and my particular interest is, and is not in the whole mainstream class, but in the children with special educational needs. Uh, who have had many years of failure and have fear of failure and how one can develop programs of intervention to get over that. Uh, so I've, I'm developing sort of interventions based on mastery learning combined with Carol Dweck's work on fear of failure. Uh, and one of the key things, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the Sutton Trust, the Education Endowment Foundation little toolkit, where they put metacognition and self-regulation very high up the list. Uh, together with, I'm looking at it now on my iPad, together with mastery learning uh, as interventions according to the toolkit that do give um, good results. Um, so I'm constantly with children who have suffered, if you like, for years of ah, systemic failure, not their own failure, and but they believe it's their own failure. But I think the failure, particularly where children fail to learn to read, for example, which I think is dreadful. Um, no child should leave primary school unable to read adequately. Um, so I'm all the time trying to address that. And um, I think it's a fair, uh, it really is a, a failure of the whole system where children don't learn to read. Every child can be taught to learn to read, if not to comprehend. That's, that's something dependent on their own cognitive ability, but not the basic reading. So I, I'm all the time trying to develop ways where children can assess work themselves and score work themselves. Uh, rather than, than to having it uh, top down. So I don't know really <laughs> whether you've got any views on that and how that can uh, assist the, the teaching profession, but I'm very much going, looking towards that small sector uh, of children who are really struggling. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, timely reminder for, for all of us, you know, what goes on in a whole range. And at one point I did a little bit of work with um, some children with special needs and, and I always thought that that was a time when my whole teaching ability was working on the edge of what I was capable of and, and if I'd understood some of the things I understand now I think I might have felt more comfortable and those children might have got more out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think you're right. I think metacognition has got a lot, has a lot of powerful, a lot of power behind it. Um, from my point of view, and personally, what I'm yet to find is really easy ways to bring that into the classroom. And also, I think it needs to be a whole school approach. So there's no a lot of these strategies, one subject or one teacher can do, and that will help students with that subject something like metacognition needs to be a completely whole school approach and student and it needs to be revisited the whole time um so i think there's been quite a lot of talk of it, about it in secondary schools um i personally don't see why it shouldn't be brought in younger um with my own son i regularly find myself asking him questions that are sort of metacognitive type questions of well how did you get that and actually in young children it's almost more evident the metacognition because it's how you're seeing how they're learning it's not sort of a hidden process so my favorite one at the moment when he's counting is if he has to add five and two he'll put the five in his head because that's what he's been told and then he'll count on two so that is metacognition. And I think that's something that we need to kind of pick up from primary schools and carry through to secondary. So we need a lot of, a lot more 
communication about these big mm -hmm. ideas across the whole phase, in my opinion. And mastery learning, is that something you consider? Um, try By which to... I mean, <laughs> making sure children actually have that fluency that somebody mentioned driving the car and talking at the same time, you know, that's because we are uh, fluent drivers. Um, I think it depends what you are trying to get them to master. And that's where it becomes a little blurry. So mastery in some places is taken to be there's this huge number of statements that students need to be able to recall and know and then they know that subject or mastery learning could be they've got a really solid understanding of key ideas so I'm a biologist the importance of increasing surface area to volume ratio is an utterly fundamental idea to how a lot of biology works that if you have a mastery of that idea, you are then much more likely to be able to transfer and apply it to other situations rather than learning a big, long list of statements. So again, it's a bit like the AFL. It's a bit like the metacognition. I don't think it's fully out there what, what's the most effective way of using these things in the classroom. And there's a lot of inconsistencies. Thank you. Eric, shall I pass on back to you? Are there any other comments you wanted to pick on in the... I've, I've not, I'm just flicking through them, but I can't see any that, you know, that I, I would pick out at the minute, but um, please do ask. Somebody's just asked if we could put our contact details back up, and I'll do that now if you like. Um, but please ask me another question while I'm doing that. Well, we've got time for one more question, shall we say. So I don't know whether Helen or you or... Um... There's all been fantastic comments. I think one question that's in there is around ed tech, and uh, that's becoming obviously increasingly uh, more relevant, um, uh, whether educational neuroscience can help teachers more with their informed choices. Um, Ellen, what's your view on ed tech in the classroom and how it can help? Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a tricky one because there's been, <laughs> Quite a, quite a quick development in terms of trying to understand it. Um, I'm going to sort of be unhelpful and say in the same way that there's so much out there that it's it needs unpicking and it needs um, understanding. And I think the same thing, if we can apply these principles and go, how would that help? Then it can hopefully steer us a little bit more in terms of... Um, what direction and what things to use. So ones that I'm currently using are things like mini whiteboards in the same way that you'd use mini whiteboards in a lesson. So that kind of fits into that um, AFL strategy. Um, and there's a fantastic one that I found. I'm happy to share what it is if anyone wants this, where you can share your board with the students. So actually that's more powerful than doing it in a classroom because you can then ask students to annotate. So today I shared a graph and ask, so the students didn't have to worry about copying what I'd done, but then we're annotating that graph. Um, and it's using that sort of principle of what do I want to get out of this? How is it going to help learning to help pick which bits of, which bits of technology to use rather than magpieing everything that's there? Actually, if I may, I've got, <clears throat> One question from, I think, for, for the academics here, because I, I know we've got a mixture of the audience. If you, as um, educators, could give one tip to academics in terms of educational neuroscience and, and, and the research out there, what would it be? Sorry, it's a tricky one, is it? But it's one that I've been I, I, I Eric, I'm going to pass I that think, on to you. I think the simple answer is talk to teachers. Um, you know, in, in, and, and I, I don't mean just talk to them and be friendly. I mean, I mean, actually be nice <laughs> talk to them about what it is they see, what is their experience, but then don't be gentle and just say, oh, yeah, that's nice. Right. But just push them a bit on what it is. Um, we, we ran a when, just sort of a little example. We ran a, a session which uh, Matt helped us organize 
on analogies. Yeah. And we had a, a mix of teachers from different subjects in the group. And it was interesting because subjects like science tend to use analogies quite regularly, it was fairly easy for them to respond and to say what they thought was good. But other subjects that don't tend to use them or they used in a way which is just sort of not really noticeable, those teachers struggled. And so actually understanding what their experience is, is, is an important part of the dimension. It doesn't, it's this transfer thing again, subjects have different um, characteristics and therefore how you, the techniques you use in teaching them will vary and yet the principles might be the same underneath. And it's understanding those subtleties that I think is the, is the difference. Sorry, I'm having problems um, doing things with my machine at the moment. Helen, can you put your email on the chat? Yeah, so maybe put it in the chat and then it can stay. Yeah, I can do that. Do you want me to put yours on as well? Yeah, because mine's not uh, responding. I've put it in, but it's not going. <laughs> there was some fantastic content. I'm aware we're going over time, so I'm going to leave it here. Um, I'd like to thank you again, Helen and Derek, for a great uh, presentation um, and all um, people in the audience who've given some great comments and questions as well. Um, there will be an email for the talk next week. Um, and so, I, yeah, thank you all for, for today and look forward to seeing you next week again for the Centre of Educational Neur Neuroscience Seminar. Thank you and thank you to everybody thank for their you. comments. Thank you very much. Attention. Will the recording be available? Uh, yes, all the recordings from all the talks are uploaded on the YouTube channel from the Centre of Educational Neuroscience. Thank so you. yes, you can always go back to them. Thank you. Just don't analyse it too much. <laughs>